Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. There is a lot of hope right now about humanity's future in space, and a lot of hype. If we just read the titles, we would think that warp drive is just around the corner. On the other hand, we often hear those who seem to practice what we call pessimistic fatalism, explain how everything we want to try has been tried, and not only did it fail, but it can't possibly succeed. How no human being can long survive the effects of low gravity, or the radiation exposure spaceflight will subject us to. While we agree that these are serious problems, none of them are without a solution. We choose to navigate a path we call optimistic realism. That means we accept as a guiding principle that humanity can expand into the solar system and survive with the proper technology. We have lessons on radiation exposure and shielding and artificial gravity, by the way. But despite these difficulties, at some point, we need to just get the job started. What would we do first if the Academy had a few billion dollars? We would first focus on the moon, as this will be humanity's testing ground for centuries to come. But we would not start by sending people to the moon. People are fragile and expensive. What would we send instead? Give us access to one starship to take 150 tons into orbit. Getting from low Earth orbit to the moon requires a delta V of about 4,100 meters per second. Assuming a specific impulse of 380 seconds from methane-fueled vacuum engines, giving us an exhaust velocity of 3,727 meters per second. It will cost us 100 of those tons to do the translunar injection and lunar orbital insertion burns needed to get us into a stable low lunar orbit. We now have 50 tons in orbit around the moon. From there, it will take at least 1,870 meters per second of delta V to land on the moon. That gets us to the surface with a little more than 30 tons. Assume that the lander had a mass of 10 tons. What would we send to the moon? A nuclear-powered, remote-controlled piece of heavy equipment. Let's look at what we could build. This is a Caterpillar D5 bulldozer. It has a mass of a little more than 19 tons. Variants of this machine have been working on Earth for decades. We would want to strip away every piece of unneeded equipment and anything that might not survive in a vacuum and replace it with something more advanced. We can add computers, telemetry, cameras, lights, and sensors for lunar operations, as well as an excavator arm, robotic manipulation arms, and a solar furnace. We would modify the hydraulics to operate in vacuum, and we would of course remove the oxygen breathing engine, and replace it with a powerful electric motor. Does this sound crazy? Something similar has already been done. This would be our Pathfinder design. This is a nuclear lunar rover called Lunacod. Lunacod was built by the Soviet Union in the 1960s. The first one landed on the moon on November 17, 1970, and was deployed the same day. It was brought to the surface by a Luna lander, and was operated by remote control from Earth. Unlike Mars, the moon is close enough for direct remote control. A five-person team of operators was able to drive the Lunacod with about a five-second response feedback delay. Lunacod had a mass of about 840 kilograms. It was 1.35 meters tall, 1.6 meters wide, and 1.7 meters long, about the size of a very small car, but shorter. It had eight wheels, each under independent control, and two forward and two reverse speeds topping out at 100 meters per hour. The latest record set by the rovers on Mars was 245.76 meters in one day, set by the Perseverance rover on the 5th of February, 2022. Perseverance could go faster than this if it wasn't limited by auto navigation. Communication with Mars is much too slow for remote control. It would take at least 40 minutes from when you turn the wheel to know if you missed the rock. 
The Lunacod used a fast decaying radioactive material called polonium to provide heat for Lunacod. Polonium can be made by bombarding bismuth with protons. One gram of polonium-210 can generate 140 watts of thermal power. This didn't require a reactor. Polonium decay spontaneously produces heat. The Soviets decided to save mass and use solar energy for electrical power, limiting driving operations to the lunar daytime, which I like to call day -loon, and using the heat of the polonium to keep the machine alive during the long lunar night, which I like to call dark moon. Radio thermoelectric generators and nuclear reactors can be very heavy and had too much mass for this mission. I would like to see Stirling engines used with this system. We have a lesson on these very efficient generators here. The Perseverance rover uses plutonium for both heat and electricity. Plutonium is extremely rare and can be used to make an atomic bomb. While the Perseverance uses an RTG, we would want to use a uranium-based small nuclear reactor, similar to the 320 kilogram Topaz-1 reactor, also built and flown by the former Soviet Union. Two of these reactors were purchased by the United States in the 1990s for only $13 million. This reactor used 96% enriched uranium oxide to produce five kilowatts of electricity. We would combine three of them to give 15 kilowatts of continuous power for less than one ton of mass. We would use solar panels also and a solar reflector. We would use our rover to scoop up regolith and filter out the fine powder. The larger pieces would be melted down to form a large plate. These would be held and positioned by the robotic arms, while a device similar to a powder-fed 3D printer would be used to seal them together and start building a structure. The first thing this machine would build would be a large landing pad to give those fragile humans a safe place to come down. It could then be used to start sealing off the bottom of a small crater, building a large circular habitat around the inside edge, then using the blade to push regolith on top for radiation shielding. We could also use electricity to melt the regolith and electrolyze it to release oxygen. Lunar regolith is on average over 40% oxygen. This oxygen would be combined with aluminum to make aluminum oxide glass. This could also be melted into large panels and sealed along the front of the habitat. The humans would then land on their safe metal pad, bringing inflatable interior modules with attached airlocks and additional radiation shielding. Inflatable furniture will work fine on the moon, where our weight is only one-sixth what it is on Earth. What is holding us back from accomplishing something like this? access to resources, and the will to risk them. All of these technologies have existed for over half a century. No human lives have to be placed at risk. The moon is our proving ground, just a few days away, waiting for us to prove that the obstacles that held us back in the past can and will fall to our technology today. Something to think about. Thanks for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And there are links to the Lunacod rover and Topaz reactor in the description. Stay safe. Ad Astra Proterra.